Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's exactly four o'clock uh, in uh, Singapore. Uh, welcome to this uh, new book launch of the, uh, the Middle East Institute. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to host uh, this event with uh, three distinguished speakers uh, who will be with us for the next uh, hour and a half. Uh, we will be uh, today with Jonathan Fulton, Lee Chen Sim, and uh, Heng Ye Kuang. Uh, let me first uh, say a few words on uh, the, the reason of this uh, book talk. Uh, we are hosting this event uh, for the launching of the, the new book edited by Jonathan Fulton and Lee Chen Sim, Asian Perceptions of Gulf Security, which is published by Rotledge. We will uh, provide actually in the chat box uh, later during the, the discussion a link to the uh, to the uh, ebook, which is on open access uh, on the website of uh, Routledge. Uh, before I start with the book, let me say a few words on uh, our speakers. Uh, Dr. Fulton is uh, Assistant Professor of Political, Sci Political Science at Zayed University uh, based in Abu Dhabi, as well as a non-resident senior fellow with the Atlantic Council uh, based in the US. Dr. Lee Chen Sim is an Assistant Professor at Khalifa University, also in uh, Abu Dhabi, as well as a non-resident uh, scholar uh, with uh, the Gulf States Institute uh, in uh, Washington. Uh, in addition to uh, our, the editors of the volume, we will be also discussing uh, with one of the contributors uh, of uh, this, uh, uh, this book, Dr. Heng Yi Huang, who's a professor at the Graduate School of Public Policy uh, with the University of Tokyo. He uh, specifically wrote uh, one of the chapters on Japan relations uh, with uh, the Gulf. As I said earlier, the, this book uh, titled Asian Perceptions of Gulf Security uh, looks at how Asian countries uh, have been uh, perceiving, but also thinking their relations uh, with the Gulf, with the Gulf states. And in a sense, it's the sequel to a first book that uh, Dr. Sim and Dr. Fulton wrote, uh, External Powers uh, and uh, the Gulf uh, Countries. Uh, and in the introduction, uh, both of you explained that uh, following this first book that covered relations between Gulf states and external powers, you wanted to look more specifically at a topic which until recently was under-researched, which is uh, the growing role uh, of Asian countries uh, in uh, the Gulf. So what I'd like to do uh, for the first uh, half of this uh, discussion, before we uh, leave the, 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 the room for the questions from the audience, is to ask uh, first uh, both uh, Jonathan and Li Chen to explain uh, maybe the the origins uh, of this book, the objective uh, that you wanted to uh, address uh, with the publication. And then later on, I'll, uh, I'll ask uh, also uh, both Li Chen and uh, Dr. Heng to, uh, uh, to uh, go into uh, more details on two of the interesting case studies. There are several case studies in the book, but both of you wrote on Singapore and Japan's relations uh, and uh, with the Gulf, uh, Gulf states. And obviously uh, the Middle East Institute being based in Singapore, this is, these are two case studies that we'd be very much interested to hear about. So without further ado, let me turn to uh, Jonathan first uh, uh, and uh, Li Chen as well for uh, some words on this, uh, the origins of the, the project. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, Jean-Lou. Thanks to the MEI for hosting us. Uh, I wish we could be there in person, but uh, next time, inshallah. You kind of gave away the big part of the origin story because, uh, you know, like you said, this started with the book that we published with Routledge in, in 2019, which Lee Chen is holding up in the screen there, External Relations in the Gulf Monarchies, which uh, Jean-Lou, you, you contributed an excellent chapter on <laughs> French engagement with the GCC. And when we finished it, we were we were pretty keen to explore it in a, a little more depth. We were thinking of maybe going in the direction of a more thematic book, like looking at different sectors, whether it's sports, security, energy, um, diplomacy, um, and just looking at how countries are engaging with the Gulf by sector. Um, but one thing we noticed, there's been a lot of analysis 
on Asian Gulf relations, this so-called Asianization of the Gulf, most of it looking at it from an economic perspective or an energy perspective. And we were thinking that, you know, it might be, not might be, it, it would definitely be interesting to look at it from a different perspective. Um, how are they gauging either politically or militarily or something beyond this energy? Because it seems like given the depth of, of engagement between Asian countries and Gulf countries, that you know it wouldn't it wouldn't stay in the realm of economics or energy for very long. So that's what we want to do here. Li Chen, do you want to say anything? Yeah, um, just to add that in in this book, um, the the first book, um, it was actually when we mentioned external powers, it was not just France. Uh, it was also the U.S. It was Turkey. It was um, Latin America. Um, you know, it was uh, uh, I think Japan. So there were a few. Uh, Asian as well as non-Asian countries that we covered. And I guess we sort of felt that we needed to zoom in more on the Asian countries, um, primarily because, you know, at, at that time, Asian countries were not very well understood. And I would argue that, you know, um, countries, or at least here when we're sitting in the Gulf. So, so yesterday, Jonathan and I gave a talk to a think tank based here in Abu Dhabi uh, on the book. And from the questions, it was quite obvious that, you know, there was not much interest in Asia's perception of the Gulf, apart from China's perception of the Gulf, um, because most of them were interested in, say, um, Iran, you know, or the US, uh, which is natural, you know, coming from this region. But um, so that's kind of why we felt that we, we, we needed to speak a little bit more in depth about the Asian perceptions and get um, authors who are Asians themselves based in these countries or experts on these countries countries, you know, to write about this from the local perspective, whether it be from um, Korea or Japan or, you know, whatever countries, India, Pakistan, that we were writing on. Um, so that's a bit about the genesis of the book. And um, I'll, I'll turn it back to John Liu. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, thank you in particular for mentioning uh, my contribution uh, to the first book. More, more seriously, the, the book starts with... Uh, a chapter that covers what you call, I believe, the transitional order or the transition uh, that the Gulf is experiencing uh, as a result of uh, global, global trends and in particular, the evolution of US uh, foreign policy. Uh, could you say, and I believe, I mean, this is uh, your chapter, Jonathan. So I'd, I'd be interested to, if you could tell us how this chapter uh, provides, in a sense, the 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 back the background to the the the, uh, the project as well. How do you see this Gulf Asian relations in that current evolving security environment? Yeah, sure. Um, but I first should just say that uh, Jean Lu, when we talk about your chapter in the first book, we don't just think of it as a contribution; we think of it as the the thing that hangs everything together. It was really the foundation of the previous book. Um, so yeah, my chapter in this one is just kind of setting the stage. I, I'm not writing about any specific country, um, but just kind of looking at what are, what are the trends that we're seeing um, from the ground here in the region. And when we looked at the countries that we have case studies, as Li Chen mentioned, there's um, the traditional powers, you know, China, India, Japan, South Korea, Pakistan, um, I think, and, and, and Singapore. Um, when you look at each of those, they've all been increasing their presence in the Gulf tremendously this century. I mean, at different points, you could see Japan starting a little earlier, um, but but it's they've they've been intensifying the presence. Like I said in the opening comments, that that we know the the energy side of the story, we know the economic side of the story. Um, the thing that's allowed most of these countries to engage with this depth is the fact that they didn't have to contribute very much to to security, even though it's a very insecure or or um, challenging environment to operate in for extra regional powers. You know, you've got this uh, intra-Gulf rivalries between Iran and the GCC. You've got tensions within the GCC, which often flare up, and it makes it pretty tough for other countries to, to operate here. Uh, the one factor that's allowed it, of course, has been this US onshore balancer approach that's existed since uh, Desert Storm, when, when the US signed these defense cooperation agreements with four GCC countries and enhanced their facilities access agreement with Oman and uh, you know, built on their security cooperation with Saudi. So this security architecture that the US reinforced created 
kind of a low cost entry into the Gulf for a lot of extra regional powers. Um, that's been beneficial, not just for the Gulf countries, uh, with the exception, of course, of Iran, um, but all these extra regional powers that have been, been deeply involved here. Um, what we've seen, of course, over the past you know, decade plus, there's been a lot of signaling from the US that local actors are perceiving as this US retrenchment or you know, hegemonic retreat that the US doesn't want to continue to play the same type of role. Um, you, could, you could place that at the disastrous invasion of Iraq, which seems strange that this is the 20th anniversary later this month. It seems not that long ago to me, but when I'm teaching my students in a few minutes, they think of it as ancient history. Um, but then, you know, subsequent uh, presidential administrations in the US, whether Obama announced his pivot to Asia or the rebalance to Asia, um, of course, during the Arab Spring, he chose not to support the Mubarak regime in Egypt, in Egypt and a lot of local leaders considered that a signal of, of uh, you know, the potential to be abandoned by the US in, in their time of need. Um, the negotiation with Iran for the, the JCPOA in, in which uh, Gulf allies and partners weren't involved and didn't realize it was taking place was another signal to local actors that the US position was changing. Um, and then during the Trump administration, this very transactional approach to regional partnerships, uh, I think also reinforced that idea. And uh, that continues, I'd say, with the Biden administration when he started his, not just his presidency, but his campaign by focusing on values and um, working with like-minded democracies um, and speaking pretty harshly about especially the Saudi Arabia government. Uh, I think a lot of actors here took all those signals into consideration and thought, you know, we've got to diversify our great power relationships. But from the Asian side of things, I think what this means is they look at this region where they've been able to enter without really having to contribute in a very significant way on the security front and thinking, well, look, we've got major economic interests. We've got significant expatriate populations. We've got investments and assets in the region. If the U.S. isn't going to maintain this kind of security architecture, what are we going to do about it? Are we going to exit? Are we going to try to shore up this, this uh, delicate regional um, ecosystem? Are we going to adopt a more traditional balancing rule? Are we going to work with you know, one local country against another? I mean, the, the typical IR questions you'd ask. So that's what we have to contributors to do is just looking at country X, what are you seeing? You know, um, what are you seeing India do or what are you seeing Singapore do? Are they adopting a hedging approach to wait and see? Are they bandwagoning? Are they balancing? Um, I think what we've seen um, is most of these Asian countries in the book are either US allies or partners. Um, they have a, a, a number of factors, which I'm sure um, Yi Kuang and Li Chen can discuss in, in their case studies, but there's a lot of reasons why they've been resisting this you know, more activist role, whether it's because of domestic political conditions or you know conditions within their own region uh, there seems to have been a reluctance for other countries to engage very deeply in security affairs um, just you know for example with South Korea where where I spent you know a number of years before I came here um, South Korea has been engaging especially with the UAE since signing this Baraka nuclear power plant deal in 2009 uh, they've got this AK unit which you know is uh, 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 elite forces that are contributing to, to training um, with UAE uh, forces. Uh, there's also a commitment to support the UAE if they were attacked by an external uh, power, which of course means Iran. Um, but that was kept secret until uh, there was a presidential uh, change, I think in 2014, um, because the then government didn't feel very comfortable acknowledging that they'd made this commitment to a country very far from their own, you know, core interests of, of, you know, Northeast Asia, given the tough conditions between Japan and Korea and Korea and South Korea and North Korea specifically, you know, to, to commit to protecting a country far away when you're still actually in, in a, a hot conflict with your next door neighbor um, is a pretty tough thing to swallow for most of the electorates. So, you know, you saw a lot of these, a lot of these uh, factors taking place um, but I guess just getting back to the role of the U.S., because the U.S. has been making these, these um, signals that it wanted to play a different role, the, the, um, I guess the, the, the explanation or the ordering principle for the region, this U.S. hegemony, 
it doesn't seem like a very acceptable explanation anymore. You know, if you look at hegemony as, as military preponderance, of course, the U.S. still is the most powerful country in the region. But if you look at a broader definition of hegemony to also include leadership, the exercise of leadership, you know, when the U.S. has been signaling that they don't want to play this, this dominant role in the region, they don't want to, um, you know, uh, deal with all, with every political uh, um, you know, issue in the Gulf, um, this starts to change the calculus. And I think this also happens at a time when China announces the Belt and Road Initiative, which is kind of a, a challenge to this patronage monopoly that the U.S. had. You know, China was always condemned as a, as a fence setter or as a, uh, a free rider. And they're saying, look, we're contributing to public goods now. We're building ports, we're building roads, we're building all these public goods that other countries can take advantage of. And it gives these countries in the Gulf, you know, uh, another option. Instead of relying solely on the U.S., they can go to, to China instead. And of course, that's the X factor. I think the other X factor beyond the domestic pressures and the regional pressures is most Asian countries in the book have challenging relations with China. And the idea of a China-centered um, presence, which I don't think is, is something we could expect, but if China were to play a, a more dominant role in setting the agenda in the Gulf, I think that would really challenge the interests of a lot of countries like India, Korea, um, Japan, as well as Gulf countries themselves. So it makes for a very fluid and, and challenging dynamic in the region. Um, I think it's it's really fascinating from an international relations perspective to watch this because you get to test a lot of theories. Um, but it also, you know, living here, it, it feels very uncertain a lot of the time. Uh, so as interesting as, as it is, it can also be quite unsettling. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan, for this, uh, uh, for uh, wrapping uh, or, or giving this uh, overview. That what's interesting from from what you just described and also from your chapter is that this this goes against the idea that uh, what's happening is just a, a great power competition, that uh, what we're witnessing is basically uh, U.S. decline leading to a U.S.-China competition uh, in uh, the Middle East or in the Gulf in particular. This is actually much more complex. And that's actually one, one other uh, reasons why the, the book uh, um, addresses uh, something that is missing uh, from the analyst, analysis right now, because you look at what also this transition means for a lot of countries that traditionally were not discussed as uh, relevant players uh, in uh, the Gulf. Uh, and that's also the reason why uh, I'll, I'll turn now to uh, uh, Dr. Li Chen uh, for uh, Singapore. Uh, and uh, your, your chapter uh, provides a great, uh, a great history, great uh, description of the evolution of Singapore's uh, perception of its role and the role itself uh, in the Gulf. And I really encourage uh, uh, our participants to uh, have a look at uh, the um, the document. Could you give us uh, uh, your, your your main uh, takeaways uh, on uh, Singapore's perception uh, of its relations with uh, the Gulf? The floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Sean Lu. Um, I happily do that. Um, so um, just a bit of background, this is actually my, I'm not actually a Singapore specialist, I'm more a Russian and Gulf, um, you know, political economy uh, of energy kind of specialist. And so when I was asked to write this chapter, um, I was a bit you know, hesitant because I'd never done it before. Um, but once I got into it, then you know, it became really interesting. Um, and and so let me just give you my take on what I see as you know how Singapore got involved and stepped up its engagement in the Gulf. So as you mentioned, Jean Lu, um, and as most of you know, Singapore has been engaged with the Gulf for decades, uh, primarily because Singapore is a major oil um, refinery center and a a, a major oil re export what hub for bunkering, uh, marine supplies, marine insurance, etc. So we've always, uh, given our resource scarcity, we've always imported uh, crude from the Gulf, uh, and turn it into petrochemicals in Singapore and then re-exported that. So relations with the Gulf is not new, it's, it's pretty historical, 70s, 80s, 90s, etc. But what really was interesting is the re-engagement or the stepped up re-engagement with the Gulf in the, ninth, uh, in the 21st century. 
So why was there this stepped up engagement? And, and there are several indicators which point to the stepped up engagement. But why was there this stepped up engagement? And it's primarily because um, Singapore, which has always pitched itself as being uh, uh, vulnerable, uh, vulnerable because of our geography, uh, vulnerable because of our topography, lack of natural resources, vulnerable because we are small in economic terms, uh, in terms of our heft, uh, you know, we are small and therefore at the mercy of bigger global forces that are largely beyond control, vulnerable in terms of piracy in the Straits of Malacca, etc., uh, vulnerable in terms of a lack of strategic depth to defend the country because of our size, vulnerable because of our multi-ethnic um, immigrant um, population. So what made Singapore really sit up and you know, re-engage the Gulf in the 21st century um, was, of course, the uh, uh, increasing uh, extremism in the region and Southeast Asia itself. Um, you had extremist groups running around, um, attacks even on Singapore itself um, stemming from the region. And so Singapore was quite mindful that it was vulnerable to these extremist acts. And part of that was being influenced, or so Singapore thought, um, from the Gulf and the wider Middle East. And so Singapore had the uh, idea that, okay, we've got to learn what's going on in the Middle East in order to try to minimize the kinds of attacks in Singapore and, of course, the subsequent consequences on our multi-ethnic population. And so this was actually a what I would call a defensive kind of engagement to actually go out there to the Gulf, to the Middle East, and to see what was going on in order to keep the social stability um, in Singapore. So I think this was the genesis of the um, origins of engagement in the 21st century, right? Um, since then, of course, um, uh, you know Singapore, uh, as you mentioned, Jean Lu, we're not just a taker. We're also we also have some agency in some of these things, even though we are a very small country. So um, Singapore, like Japan, like Korea, thinking about its domestic considerations or constraints. Um, we've tried to go beyond that to reach out to the Middle East in terms of diplomatic engagement opening many more um, representations and embassies there, uh, reaching out to try to connect um, via um, civil service, um, via trainings for customs in the Middle East. Uh, Singapore has a much lauded customs procedure with our ports. It's a very seamless uh, entry and customs and clearance, uh, bringing that to the Gulf, for example. Um, and so we've tried all these different kinds of engagements, even in terms of security. In the 21st century, uh, Singapore was sending not independent deployments, but deployments with the US-led uh, multinational team to counter piracy in and around the Gulf or, or even in, in Iraq, some of the extremist uh, acts there. Um, so we've been sending troops there as part of NATO or US-led uh, forces, such as the counterterrorism um, task force uh, in the maritime realm. So Singapore has tried to contribute a bit to security there. But of course, being mindful that as a small country, we can't do that much in terms of security on our own, but we can surely augment existing forces. And Singapore has led some of these uh, counter-terrorism task force um, in the maritime realm before. Um, so that was one of its um, contributions to Gulf security. Um, overall, though, Singapore is uh, engaged, uh, stepped up its engagement with the Gulf, not just because of a defensive kind of engagement um, with regards to extremism, um, but I think it's also been mindful about um, disruptions to seaborne trade, given that we are so dependent on seaborne trade, um, of course, energy in particular, but not just energy. Uh, we've also been mindful about the fact that um, Dubai is a competition to Singapore. Fujairah, the port of Fujairah, is also a competition to the bunkering hub in Singapore. And so we wanted to uh, see if we could actually learn from these cities, can learn from Fujairah as a port, or find some kinds of synergy. So yes, it was partly the defensive thing, but it was basically also a commercial as well as a political engagement. Um, 
if you ask whether Gulf security these days, uh, not in the early 2000s, but these days in the 2020s, is Gulf security still an important consideration for Singapore? I would say that it's, it is not an overriding concern, right? It is not the straw that would break the camel's back in terms of Singapore's engagement with the Gulf. Why? Because um, Singapore, I think, is used to piracy problems, right? If, if, uh, piracy is a huge problem in, 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 in the Straits here. Um, there's much more piracy attacks in the Straits than in the Gulf. Um, so we're quite used to piracy issues. We're quite used to risks to seaborne traffic. Uh, and in Singapore, the shippers, the, the, the traders merely de-risk that by paying higher insurance premiums if needed, right? So, so piracy issues is not a big, it's not that huge in the Gulf. It's not a big concern. Um, it, Singapore knows that there are um, independent naval units, like say uh, in Japan or Korea, who do step up. In addition to, of course, US-led multinational task force that step up to piracy um, and and patrolling the safety of the waters. Um, so I, I don't think that there is a huge concern about Gulf security deterring um, engagement. Singapore companies that are there also don't have a big full-time presence, unlike, say, Korea, which has got something like 13,000 expats in the Middle East. Singapore only has, you know, at the most, something like 2,000 at the most. And the presence that we have there is not full-time. It's not like contractors who work there. It's mostly people who, who do services. So, you know, you open a hotel um, for management uh, reasons. You manage a hotel, you train the staff, and then you leave and you come back every few months to check on it. So it's not a permanent presence of Singaporeans there, um, which will have an impact on, you know, the security of, of Singapore citizens. You, you have your architectural firms, but, you know, these are very, minimal uh, uh, low manpower services as opposed to the bigger construction firms. So um, security therefore is uh, hard security is not that much a concern for the, these reasons. And finally, Singapore knows that Gulf energy, Gulf um, exporters are very reliable suppliers, right? Um, it, it, it's it, supply has not uh, stopped. Uh, supply has continued to flow even through attacks. Um, there is Gulf oil storage in Japan and in Korea. So if there are emergencies in Hormuz, um, Singapore could still draw on these supplies if needed. Um, so, so for all these reasons, um, hard security issues in the Gulf has, has somewhat um, declined uh, with the decline of extremism as well. And so um, I, I don't see um, a big concern uh, in Singapore with these hard security issues, uh, uh, putting a, a crimping some of these uh, economic and, and business engagement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Li Chen. And uh, what's interesting from what you explain is uh, we see a, a clear uh, evolution. The fact that uh, initially it, it's mostly, as you said, about a defensive engagement to prevent uh, security concerns uh, that may uh, come from the, the Gulf, uh, but that more and more, given the, the growth of the Gulf as a geopolitical and economic region, uh, you, you see and you describe here uh, a lot of new political and commercial interest. Uh, what I'd be interested to hear uh, uh, now from uh, Dr. Henge Yekwong is actually how similar that could be in the case of Japan, because uh, your chapter also provides uh, a detailed uh, account on the evolution of Japan. And uh, uh, what's remarkable in the, the chapter is that we see that this is not an obvious evolution, that Japan has been struggling in some cases uh, with uh, its ambitions, its uh, objectives uh, in the Gulf. So let, let me now turn to you uh, uh, to talk more about uh, this uh, fascinating case study of Japan, uh, Japanese uh, per perceptions uh, of Gulf security. Floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, uh, John Luke. And um, I would also like to uh, echo uh, Jonathan's uh, thanks uh, to you, John Luke, uh, for, for hosting us uh, for, for this uh, event. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll try to address some of those uh, questions. Uh, I, I'm a bit of a scatterbrain, so I, I sort of prepared a, a PowerPoint so I can keep it a bit more coherent, uh, hopefully. So let me uh, share my screen. I hope it works. 
Uh, okay, so. Yes, we can see it. Yes. All right. Okay. Cool. Good. Uh, okay. So um, so my contribution uh to to this uh, book volume was really to to look at Japan's uh, evolving uh role um in Gulf security and also more more specifically thinking about you know how uh Japan envisions itself uh as performing uh that particular uh role. So let me begin by you know. You know, dealing with this notion of uh, Japan as an honest broker, um, and this is an idea that was uh, presented by uh, the then Defense Minister Kono Taro uh, when he uh, spoke at the uh, Manama uh, Dialogue in 2019. And you know, as you can see on on screen, um, you know, the suggestion was simply that Japan could play an honest broker role in the Middle East, uh, taking advantage of the fact that it had no colonial history and also um, no negative uh, footprint um, in the region. So that's the you know, starting assumptions uh, that were presented by uh, Minister Kono uh, in 2019. And of course, Japan has vital interests uh, to protect. Um, former Foreign Minister Motegi uh, Toshimitsu actually was very quite very open and and you know uh, stated uh, frankly that you know uh, Japan was very dependent uh, on the Middle East for up to ninety percent uh, of its crude oil needs and that's a key critical reason why uh, peace and stability of uh, the region was a vital and extremely important uh, concern for uh, Japan. So um, let me talk, talk a bit more about um, Kono's speech at the uh, Manama Doilo and when he tried to highlight, you know, uh, Japan's contributions uh, to addressing the maritime security challenges in the region. And of course, you know, um, Kono was uh, trying to put a spin on, you know, Japan's uh, long-standing uh, engagement uh, in the region um, and uh, listed uh, a range of uh, deployments. Um, of the uh, Japan Self-Defense Force, uh, starting with uh, the mine-sweeping mission after the uh, 1991 Gulf War. Um, and this was actually the first uh, overseas deployment uh, of Japan's uh, Self-Defense Forces uh, after 1945. Um, he then goes on to talk a lot more about um, the fact that, you know, uh, Maritime Self-Defense Force uh, liaison officers are, are deployed um, embedded uh, with the uh, Combined Task Force 151 headquarters, uh, Anti-Piracy anti Multinational Task Force established in 2009. And I think there are also other examples of uh, Japan's uh, self-defense forces trying to play a role um, in uh, regional security concerns. Um, so uh, Lee Chen mentioned uh, Singapore's uh, contributions to the Iraq uh, mission. Uh, Japan also deployed quite a substantial uh, contingent of uh, uh, ground self-defense forces to the uh, US-led uh, stabilization mission in Iraq in 2004 to 2006. Um, and quite similar to the uh, Singaporean contribution, uh, the MSDF has also uh, deployed destroyers on, on counter piracy operations in the Gulf of Aden since 2009. Um, and since 2020 has also uh, deployed uh, destroyers uh, for the, what's called an information collection mission uh, in the Gulf of Oman and the Northern Arabian Sea. Uh, I'll come back to this uh, second information collection mission uh, uh, towards the end of uh, my presentation. Um, I think we also see uh, Japan um, scaling up its uh, participation in uh, maritime exercises in uh, regional waters. Uh, so Japan's a, a regular participant in uh, the Malabar exercises, uh, also the La Perouse exercise, and, and more recently also the uh, Pakistan-led uh, Amand uh, multilateral exercises as well. Um, in the Gulf itself, uh, Persian Gulf, it, uh, it is a regular uh, contributor in the international countermeasures exercise uh, since uh, 2012. And we also see um, um, MSDF uh, training uh, squadrons, uh, making port calls and visiting uh, Jeddah, for example, uh, Jabal Ali, uh, and also Muscat uh, over the past uh, 10 years. So, you know, Japan's Maritime Self-Defense Force actually does have a presence uh, in the region. Um, and I want to talk a bit more about the, um, the um, IDP, which is the annual uh, long-range 
uh, Indo-Pacific deployment that the MSDF has uh, undertaken um, since 2019. And this is normally composed of a naval task group, uh, usually a flat top uh, helicopter uh, destroyer carrier, um, accompanied by um, smaller uh, destroyers uh, and you know uh, frigates occasionally. Um, but uh, this um, IDP task group, uh, as far as I know, has, has not yet visited the Gulf. Uh, but uh, what's interesting is that um, in 2023, the Indo-Pacific and Middle East deployment uh, called IMAT 23 uh, will send actually two minesweepers to Bahrain uh, to participate in the um, inter international mine countermeasures exercise, uh, which I mentioned earlier. So it's, it's quite interesting, I think, for, for me to, to see this um, merging of the IDP deployments into this uh, Indo-Pacific and Middle East deployments. I have, I have, I have to probably uh, dig a bit more into you know, how this sort of merging of deployments sort of uh, came about. Um, and also, of course, um, the Air Self-Defense Force uh, transport aircraft have also you know, stopped over in Dubai uh, to pick up um, you know, humanitarian supplies uh, for uh, Ukrainian uh, refugees in Poland and, and Romania uh, last year. Um, so I think apart from you know, this uh, increasing uh, presence of the Japan self-defense force in, in the region, uh, one interesting trend is also the diversification um, of uh, Japan's uh, presence. Uh, and I think um, although Japan is greatly reliant um, on oil supplies, but if you look at um, Japan's comprehensive uh, strategic partnership uh, initiative uh, framework that was uh, launched uh, with the uh, UAE in 2018 and just uh, signed uh, last year in September, um, you see that um, the partnership has actually diversified into quite a, a wide range of uh, different sectors and different issues, uh, ranging from you know, renewable energy, uh, green ammonia, uh, hydrogen space, uh, education, uh, my university has been uh, quite actively part of that education component, uh, water desalination, climate change, so the list actually uh, goes on. Um, so there's this diversification going on, um, and um, in September last year, um, Japan and UAE actually signed a defense cooperation and technology transfer uh, agreement. And I think this is quite interesting because usually this is uh, seen as helping to facilitate potential uh, defense sales and transfers of equipment uh, between Japan and its uh, partners. Um, so that's something uh, that could be quite interesting to watch. Uh, and Jap Japanese companies have been using the UAE as a hub for innovation. Um, so uh, the Jetro office in Dubai uh, was quite actively promoting 10 uh, Japanese uh, startup companies at the uh, GTEx uh, Future Stars uh, event in 2020. And I think overall, if you look at the Abraham Accords, uh, that also could potentially provide a boost for a deeper uh, Japanese engagement with uh, Israel, uh, UAE and uh, Bahrain. I'll just make a point here about um, how Japan and the UAE are both uh, serving on the UN uh, National uh, UN Security Council um, as uh, non-permanent members in 2023, and uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, is very high on Japan's agenda. Um, so I think um, we'll have to see uh, to what extent uh, Japan's, you know, attention on the Russian invasion of Ukraine and Japan's, you know, quite strong. Uh, stance uh, criticizing Russia, how that will play out in terms of uh, the UAE position uh, on the uh, Ukraine war as well. So let me turn quickly to the uh, intra-GCC uh, dispute, um, which I, I touched on in, in my chapter as well. Um, and I think um, if we look at what Japan, Japan is trying to do uh, with this dispute, it actually played a rather limited uh, role um, and there were actually no disruptions to, you know, Qatari gas supplies flowing uh, to Japan. Um, so what Japan did that time under uh, the late uh, Prime Minister Abe was uh, that, you know, it tried to, you know, um, be seen as not taking sides uh, in that dispute. So uh, Abe, for instance, uh, telephoned uh, um, Saudi Crown Prince MBS. Uh, he also telephoned uh, the Emir of Qatar. Uh, at the same time to, you know, demonstrate Japan's support for Kuwait's attempt to bring about uh, reconciliation. 
Um, so, you know, I think that's again reflects uh, Japan's uh, position that doesn't, you know, necessarily want to be drawn into taking sides on that uh, dispute. Um, so, overall, if you look back at what happened with the intra GCC dispute, I think Japan Saudi relations, Japan UAE relations do not seem to have uh, suffered uh, notable damage uh, as, you know, fallout from uh, the crisis. Um, I think if you look at other sort of regional issues, the Yemen civil war, the attacks by the Houthis, um, Japan has also played a relatively limited role, um, providing you know mostly humanitarian assistance, uh, assistance uh, for political transition, uh, assistance for counterterrorism. So relatively uh, limited um, contributions uh, to addressing these regional uh, issues. Um, so finally, let me turn to um, Iran. Um, so I think many people know that uh, Japan has uh, actually maintained uh, relatively uh, friendly uh, relations of, uh, with Iran. Um, and uh, I've, I've presented this as, as part of an attempt to hedge. Uh, and uh, also I think it's uh, rather consistent uh, with uh, Kono's uh, suggestion that uh, Japan would try to serve as an honest uh, broker. And I think this was exemplified uh, with uh, uh, Abe Shinzo's uh, visit to Tehran to, to see uh, the Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei. Um, another indicator of this uh, attempt to, you know, to become, you know, more of an honest broker um, is uh, the uh, information collection mission uh, by the MSDF, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, notably uh, for Japan as a key US ally, uh, Japan decided to present this information collection mission uh, as an, quote, independent initiative um, outside of the US-led uh, Operation Sentinel. Um, if you look at the uh, JMOD, uh, Japanese Ministry of Defense uh, website, it, it actually explains in quite some depth, you know, uh, the reasons why uh, Japan decided to present this as an independent initiative, although it does you know, coordinate and share information with US-led Operation Sentinel. Uh, critically, if you look at the scope of geographical operations, uh, they do not extend to the Strait of Hormuz uh, or the Persian Gulf. So it's mostly limited to the uh, Northern Arabian Sea and also the Gulf of Oman. Um, another indicator of this, we see Abe trying to play this brokering role uh, visiting, you know, uh, the Saudi Crown Prince, uh, MBS, uh, the, the then Abu Dhabi uh, Crown Prince, MBZ, and also the Sultan Oman, uh, personally, right, to explain uh, the uh, information collection mission. Um, also uh, briefed uh, Iranian President Rouhani uh, in Tokyo when he came to visit Japan. Um, Japan has continued to support the uh, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, despite the U.S. withdrawal under Trump. And, you know, the way in which... Um, Japan has positioned itself vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran. I think this is uh, interpreted as a signal that it's not necessarily 100% uh, fully aligned with uh, the US over the nuclear issue. And these are you know, arguments that uh, Japanese analysts have put forward um, as well. So um, I think Abe has uh, you know, consistently tried to you know, present Japan as having something you know, unique to contribute. Uh, because it has this very strong alliance relationship with the US, um, but at the same time, it has been maintaining, you know, these long-standing uh, relationships with Iran as well. So this, uh, you know, desire to maintain multi-pronged uh, partnerships, you know, for as long as possible uh, is, is usually, you know, interpreted, at least in the international relations theory, uh, as part of an attempt to hedge. Uh, although, you know, it's, it's quite interesting because Japan's, you know, uh, alliance with the US uh, makes it rather difficult for, for Japan to present uh, its, its position as, as an honest broker uh, in this sense. So I think uh, I, I should uh, stop here and uh, leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this, uh, this great uh, overview of the, the Japanese uh, experience. Uh, before we move to uh, uh, the, the discussion with the audience, uh, and for those uh, who'd like to ask your questions, uh, you you can enter, you can write your your question in, in the chat box uh, to MEI events, uh, and uh, we will then uh, ask the question to the uh, to the, the speakers uh, after that. Uh, 
And in the meantime, bef uh, before I get uh, the first questions, let me let me ask you the first one. And this is a this is a question actually uh, for the three of you, uh, because you you explained in very much detail how uh, the the view of uh, Asian countries uh, has evolved uh, regarding Gulf security and Gulf countries. One question that I had listening to you was how do Gulf can how do Asian countries uh, look at the nature of the political systems uh, in in the Gulf? Uh, what I mean by that is that if you look at the Western coverage uh, of uh, events in the Gulf, and in particular uh, before the World Cup, uh, most of the Western media coverage was negative and was emphasizing the authoritarian nature of the political system in Qatar. There was a lot of discussion about treatment of uh, uh, the expat workers. Uh, and I'm curious how this view, which is uh, at the center of the Western perception of Gulf countries, would be very different in uh, in Asia. I, I assume this is very different from uh, what you see in the US, uh, in Canada, or in Europe. How? What is your take on that? And uh, I don't know who would like to uh, to start. Oh, Li Chen, go first. Okay, um, I will start by saying that the Singapore is forever pragmatic, and I think it sees its pragmatism uh, reflected in the Gulf, right? They, they kind of reflect the pragmatism back at each other. So um, Singapore, you know, as you probably know, doesn't really comment much on the, um, the governance system here, but what I always hear time and again from uh, Singapore officials and business people that I've interviewed for this chapter um, is the fact that they are very forward thinking, right? So, so this phrase comes up a lot that in the Gulf, especially, I guess, you know, UAE, um, it's very forward thinking. They think about the future. Um, you know, they, they, it's not just like some other Middle Eastern countries where they think of the here and now, right? What's going to happen uh, in the next two years, three years, but it's more like, you know, five years, 10 years, 30 years down the road. So they have that vision, and um, a, a quite a lot of the, the interviewees that I've talked to say that, and they find not just they have the vision, but they also have the capacity to implement it. So I think, you know, that there is an appreciation that the governance here um, in the UAE is very different from, say, the wider Middle East. And um, I guess that's why, you know, quite a lot of Singapore companies um, would choose to set up uh, here in, in the UAE um, rather than, say, in, you know, any of the bigger um, Middle Eastern countries. Thank you. Jonathan? Yeah, so um, I think there's a couple of things. Uh, I, I typically focus on China Gulf relations. So most of my research is on China in the region. Um, one thing that I keep uh, coming across when I'm talking to, to Chinese analysts or when I'm reading their work is they spend a lot of time trying to understand the Arab Spring or the Arab uprisings. And one of the things that you know puzzled them was why did monarchies uh, remain somewhat durable while a lot of other regime types didn't. And that seems to be a, a takeaway is that, you know, I hear a lot of people say, you know, um, again, thinking about the Chinese perspective that, that uh, you know, they're not comfortable working with monarchies because of their, their, you know, communist party ideology. But I think, again, similar to what Li Chen's describing in, in Singapore, the pragmatism, just knowing that these these regimes seem quite durable. They've been in place for for generations, right? You know, before the modern statehood, the same families have been ruling their um, polities for for many 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 generations. I think there's a, a respect of that. Um, I've often heard folks from different Asian countries say, you know, they'll they'll kind of denigrate this side of the Gulf with you know the tribes with flags, uh, and that Iran is the more natural partner. But I think everybody's freaked out by an Islamic republic. You know, the idea that this government is is driven by this theological um, model, um, it seems very difficult to work with. I think it also, everybody realizes that Iran is largely controlled by the IRGC, so it's not a very comfortable place to do business. They know that the, the economy is dominated by, 
you know, the the uh, Ayatollah in the military. So they're not going to have much uh, of an opportunity to to, you know, if there if there's any commercial dispute, it's not like they're going to go to a court and get a fair hearing. Where in in other Gulf countries, there's a sense that there is more of a rule of law. So I think just generally. Um, you know, there is a, a, a sense that this is a better or easier place to work. At the same time, I talked to a lot of different embassies or personnel from embassies here in, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, one common refrain is that there's not a lot of deep experience here with the exception of Pakistan and India among the case study countries. You know, it's not like, say, the US or France or the UK where they've got, you know, decades and decades of Middle Eastern experience. This is still kind of early days in a lot of these relationships, and they're kind of building that capacity. It, again, like if you go to, you know, uh, to, to London or, or to Michigan, you're going to find all these great Middle East studies programs with, with lots of folks with great language skills. In a lot of Asian countries that we're studying here, um, that, that capacity is just being developed. So I think it's still kind of, uh, you know, trying to figure out how the region works. Thank you. You, you Huang. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just add on a, a couple of uh, points. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a great question, uh, John, because, you know, um, what's the role of values in, in Japan's uh, free and open Indo-Pacific uh, vision? Uh, there's, there's always this emphasis on democracy, uh, upholding human rights and the rule of law. Uh, but the problem is that many, many you know, countries that Japan is trying to promote this vision to might not necess necessarily share uh, those values. Um, so um, I think, you know, uh, Japan has, has uh, engaged with, for example, uh, China after the Tiananmen uh, incident when, you know, Western uh, countries uh, imposed sanctions on, on China and, and still, you know, quite distant from China, but Japan continued engaging uh, with uh, China. Uh, likewise, uh, Japan continued engaging with Myanmar uh, as well, uh, when Western countries have started, you know, imposing sanctions on, on Myanmar. Um, so, you know, I think to, to, to some extent, it, it does mirror uh, what Li Chen was saying about this rather more pragmatic uh, approach uh, to, you know, uh, engaging uh, with these countries who do not necessarily share your, your same uh, political uh, values uh, to the same uh, extent. So I think, yeah, this, this does raise a, a broader uh, question about, you know, to, to what extent should Japan place emphasis on, you know, democracy, uh, rule of law, human rights, and especially, you know, after the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, we see increasingly the debate being posed in this, you know, uh, very stark uh, terms, right, of uh, democracies versus autocracies, uh, and to what extent that's going to complicate uh, Japan's engagement with uh, partner states in the Indo-Pacific, right, um, many of them who might not necessarily be democracies, uh, might not be autocracies either, but somewhat in between. So, you know, that there needs to be a bit more nuanced. Uh, I think if Japan wants to really, you know, uh, more efficiently uh, promote its, its free and open Indo-Pacific vision, I mean, given these, uh, you know, ongoing, uh, you know, pressures, you know, to, to choose sides uh, in, in that sense. I'll, I'll stop. Thank you very much. And uh, the, this, uh... This uh, tells us more about uh, the uh, the priorities and also the dilemmas that, uh, to be fair, uh, are also very similar to what some of the Western countries also face. Uh, let's say uh, uh, norms versus realism. Um, let me add uh, another question that I just received, uh, which is about the Abraham Accords. Uh, and uh, uh, Yi Huang, you you mentioned in your in your slides. Uh, the the role of the Abraham Accords in the case of Japan, uh, and when we look at the Gulf, it's uh, it's fair to say that what happened after the Abraham Accords with Israel in 2020 changed the the ge geopolitics, the diplomacy uh, of the region. How much in each of the countries that you that the three of you have been uh, covering? How much does the Abraham Accord play a role in changing, maybe reinforcing uh, the view of uh, Asian countries regarding the Gulf? Does that actually help uh, relations with the region? Or do you see that as actually uh, more complicated if uh, this is a country uh, that may, uh, may have a strong, uh, strong resistance to the idea of uh, relations with Israel? So, 
uh, what are your views on uh, on this uh, uh, aspect? Should we start? Yeah, you go. Yeah. So, so I, I'll I'll take a stab at this since I, I sort of raised this uh, in in my uh, presentation. Um, I think um, as as I mentioned, uh, Japan has been you know adopting a, a multi pronged approach to you know cultivating partnerships uh, with countries in the region, Israel. Uh, has been a, has been a, a you know a country where Japan has maintained uh, good relations with, uh, and likewise with uh, the UAE as well. So you know because of the way Japan has positioned itself, uh, maintaining these multi pronged partnerships, I think it is in a good position to actually you know derive benefits um, from the Abraham uh, Accords. So the UAE Israel Japan uh, triangle. Um, I think is is quite interesting and a lot of, lot of potential uh, to to look at. So um, if I remember correctly, some st statistics that I, I came across, Jap Jap a lot of Japanese investors have been uh, flowing uh, into um, Israel, uh, startups and you know um, tech startups and AI uh, startups um, as a result of uh, the Abraham um, Accords. So there there's, there seems to be quite a fair bit of opportunity uh, opening opening up um, as well. And um, I think also on the defense and security cooperation front uh, as well. Uh, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, if 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 I remember reading uh, some of the reports correctly, um, the UAE and Israel had been developing some um, defense cooperation uh, and military exercises um, as well. Um, so that I think could open up more space for for Japan um, to play uh, a more. Um, well, more active role if it wished and if it could possibly do um, in, in that region. So this, I think, would be quite a significant, uh, you know, opening uh, for Japan uh, to take advantage of in a way uh, because of the way that it has maintained actually good relations uh, with you know, all these critical countries that have uh, brought about the, the Abraham Accords uh, in 2020. I'll jump in for a second, Jean-Lou. Um, first, a shameless plug. I host a podcast for the Atlantic Council called the China Mina Podcast. And our latest episode came out last night. And in it, I talked to C. Raja Mohan, who spent quite a lot of time at in US um, looking at South Asian politics. So we talked a lot about what India is doing in the region. And the Abraham Accords, of course, is something that's really opened up a lot of space for India as well. You know, we see this I2U2 configuration, the India, Israel, UAE, and US. Um, one point he made in our conversation was, you know, for decades, India was trying to avoid um, aligning very closely to Gulf Arab countries, the US, and Israel. And now they're three of, you know, India's most important partners. Um, so it really does seem to change a lot of the... Uh, regional configurations. Um, I'm looking at it from, from the perspective of how it affects China. I mean, at first I thought, you know, if, if the Abraham Accords contribute to regional stability, then that's a public good for everybody, right? Like, you know, China's interests in the region are primarily economic. And if this kind of brings down the temperature and makes things a little easier, especially with China trying to build this, uh, you know, get contracts on this land bridge that would connect the Arabian Peninsula you know these these Gulf cities to to the Mediterranean, and also this port in Haifa that that China is managing. You know this is all good for everybody. Uh, but I think looking at these, you know, again this I two U two, this new mini lateral, and I'm I'm a bit of a skeptic. But they had a meeting here in Abu Dhabi yesterday. Um, there is some movement towards you know trying to to make it a little more active. And I think what the U.S. is promoting with I2U2 is, is another one of these Indo-Pacific minilaterals that largely targets uh, China. Um, in this case, it seems a response to Chinese gains in, in the Middle East. Um, so I don't know if it's actually going to help China's situation that much. I mean, when you look at what China does with Israel, there's already a, a pretty low ceiling because Israel is just so utterly dependent on its relationship with the U.S. And the, they've been backing away on most serious engagement in tech or in critical infrastructure or, or really um, a lot of different types of trade with China already uh, under, you know, U.S. pressure. Uh, India, of course, you know, there's no love lost between China and India, but the UAE, I think, is the interesting linchpin here where, you know, they've made it very clear that they don't assess China as the same kind of threat that the U.S. does or India does. Um, 
if I2U2 is about largely geoeconomic cooperation, focusing on tech and food security, um, India looks at Chinese tech in a, even harsher terms than the US does. I mean, they've, they've eliminated almost every type of chi Chinese application or, or technology or 5G and everything, TikTok's been banned. So, you know, cooperation between UAE and India on the tech sector could actually be more complicated because of this. So, you know, I, I, I'm a geopolitics guy. When I look at this, I think it gets really kind of interestingly messy pretty fast. Thank you, Jonathan. Li Chen, would you like to add? Yeah, um, let me add it from the Singapore perspective. And I think um, given our multi-ethnic um, society, um, that was a really interesting question on the Abraham Accords, you know, its impact on Singapore society, and particularly since uh, Singapore has actually um, enforced sanctions against Iran um, as, as part of the UN sanctions, um, we've deployed forces to Iraq um, as part of the US uh, multinational force, you know, whether that will, you know, whether those incidents will generate some kind of backlash from, you know, the multi-ethnic society that we have here. So, so that was some of the questions I posed to people I interviewed for for this article and um, you know whether it's going to give rise to social instability here. So um, as you know, we have in Singapore um, uh, people from uh, you know Yemen, longtime traders who came from Yemen, longtime traders who came from Iran. So, so they form part of this multi-ethnic mosaic. And the response I got during the interviews was that um, these traders, trading families have been here for decades, have been here for centuries in some cases, and they don't really have much uh, link uh, to their homeland, whether in Persia, Iran, or whether in um, Yemen. And so they are not as you know, engaged um, politically uh, in these regions. Um, so that these um, closer relations with Israel, Singapore's close, close relations with Israel um, over the decades, although it was a sensitive topic in 1986 when the president of Israel visited Singapore, 30 years later when Netanyahu visited Singapore in 2017, you know, there were no protests as there were 30 years ago, there was no, you know, um, letters handed over, uh, you know, to protest against the visit, etc. Um, so in that sense, um, I think, um, you know, a Singapore identity has formed that actually takes precedence over some of these um, more uh, ethnically based um, immigrant identities from, you know, decades ago. Thank you. You do actually uh, in the, the chapter describe in uh, in details where the events, I believe, uh, in the, the 80s, which are uh, quite fascinating uh, in the case of uh, Singapore uh, and the visit uh, at that time of, uh, I, I forgot which Israel's prime minister it was, but... Uh, yeah. uh, thank, thank you uh, for, for your answers. Let me turn now to uh, uh, the next questions, which is coming from uh, my colleague, uh, uh, at uh, the Institute, uh, Clemens Shea. And he has one question for uh, each of you and one other question specifically for Jonathan. Uh, the first one is, to what extent can Asian countries have a role in Gulf security framework? Are there any stakes significant enough for Asia to partake in enhancing uh, regional security? Uh, so that's the question uh, for each of you. Uh, a more specific question now that uh, Clemens has for uh, Jonathan. He uh, refers to uh, the uh, the book chapter from uh, Sun De Gong uh, in the book, uh, which is uh, titled uh, China's Zero Enemy Policy in the Gulf. Uh, and he asks ask you specifically, what is your take, uh, I believe, on this title? And uh, to take it a step further, does China have a best friend uh, in the Gulf? Uh, so that's uh, the second question. Uh, let's start, I believe, uh, with the first one. Uh, let's go back to Yi Kuang, uh, maybe um, for that one. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you so much. So um, Japan um, actually has huge stakes uh, in in regional security, uh, not least uh, as I mentioned, because of uh, dependence on energy uh, security, and also increasingly in terms of uh, you know. 
this shift towards uh, a trying to attempt a net zero as well. Uh, there are shipments of uh, ammonia and hydrogen that, that flow from uh, the UAE these days to, to Japan. So that initial uh, focus on hydrocarbons has actually now also increasingly become uh, reoriented uh, towards this focus on trying to achieve uh, net zero as well. But nevertheless, coming back to you know historical memory, uh, for Japan, uh, Japan was extremely, uh, you know, uh, traumatized, I have to say, by the, um, you know, the first uh, oil shock in the 1970s. Um, and there was huge runs in Japan on, on toilet paper, and that's still uh, often, you know, uh, presented on media as well. So, you know, when we had these uh, uh, similar uh, panic buying over toilet paper uh, at the start of the COVID crisis, there was some flashbacks, right, uh, in terms of uh, the 1970s, where, you know, people uh, started panic buying uh, for toilet paper. So it, it, it is very much uh, seared into the, the memory uh, of Japan uh, from 1970s, uh, in that what happens in the Gulf has implications for what happens uh, in Japan uh, and even to individual households um, as well. Um, and these days in, in Japan, it's, uh, you know, as in many countries around the world, it's, it's all to do with, you know, how to deal with uh, the rising costs of living. And, you know, all, all these questions are very relevant uh, to, to Japan's uh, case uh, as well. And also, of course, um, at the Gulf, is another place where Japan suffered trauma, and this was the Gulf War trauma in 1991, uh, where Japan belatedly sent, uh, as I mentioned, uh, minesweepers uh, uh, after the war and uh, was criticized for checkbook diplomacy. And then that triggered you know, quite a lot of reflection in Japan uh, about you know, what's uh, Japan's uh, role, Japan's responsibility as uh, one of the largest economies in the world, and being accused of uh, chatbot diplomacy. So that triggers quite a lot of uh, self-reflection uh, on Japan's you know, uh, responsibilities and, and, and duties you know, to maintain uh, security. And this is especially relevant uh, given uh, former uh, Prime Minister Abe's uh, focus on proactive contributions right, to, uh, to peace and, and security. So when you know, he pitched Japan's role as a proactive contributor to peace. And uh, when the US uh, come knocking on uh, Japan's door and say, you know, look, are you going to help us with uh, the Operation Sentinel? Uh, you know, and then Japan faces this dilemma, right? You, you've got this proactive uh, banner that you've raised uh, and, you know, you can't just sit back and, and do nothing, especially uh, when, you know, Japanese uh, oil tankers were actually uh, attacked. Um, as well. So there's also quite a lot of domestic pressure from uh, Japanese uh, ship owners uh, associations as well, uh, that Japan, you know, should take some action. Uh, and especially, you know, if you have uh, declared yourself to be a more proactive contributor uh, to peace and security, you know, uh, you, you do need to, you know, take some um, action. And in the end, it was a bit of a fetch, it was a bit of a compromise. Uh, but, uh, you know, it was uh, it was seen as an attempt uh, by uh, Japan, you know, to play a, a more significant role in, in managing, you know, regional security tensions. And of course, with uh, Abe's visit to Tehran, uh, that wasn't seen as a huge success, uh, but uh, at least it was presented, at least in the conservative media, uh, as a case of, you know, uh, the prime minister uh, being someone who has very close ties with President Trump, uh, yet also having maintained relationships with uh, Iran, uh, you know, only he could have uh, undertaken such a mission. At least that was that was the case uh, uh, being presented by the conservative media uh, in in Japan. So you know, there are all these different uh, conceptions about you know Japan's stake in the region, historical memory, uh, and also you know contemporary you know um, visions of uh, what Japan's role uh, should be. Uh, I'll stop here. Let me turn to Li Chen. Thank you. Hey, um, so uh, addressing Clement's question on the Asian security, um, Singapore does have a stake. Um, but one thing I found interesting, or maybe I should highlight, is that a lot of Singapore's um, oil, uh, crude oil imports, it, it's not a government-to-government -government kind of arrangement, like in some of the uh, cases here uh, in the Gulf and in Asia. Uh, much of the arrangements is actually a 
private commercial decisions by the refineries, by the oil traders that are actually based in Singapore. So it's not a G2G thing. It's very much a private decision. So in that sense, the government does not have very much control and it leaves the decisions, supply chain issues, security issues to these um, private importers, to these shippers, to these insurance companies. Um, and I think it believes in the power of market forces, um, especially in the oil industry, which is quite a well oil industry, forgive the pun. Um, but as you can see from the Russian case, you know, the oil is a very, um, the, the movements of oil is quite effective, even given sanctions and given all these um, price caps and, and other constraints. Um, but I will say that Singapore, um, because of its limited manpower, uh, its limited size, you know, it cannot it cannot contribute independently of its own, uh, unlike Korea, unlike Japan, in some cases. But it has to do so in the context of cooperation with, say, um, you know, a U.S. led mission or even even a U.N. sanctioned mission. So that's where it can contribute security wise. Um, but you know, on its own, it's it's just impossible. Um, as for a wider Asian collective security approach, let's say uh, you know an ASEAN kind of approach to uh, to the Gulf in terms of a you know a security thing, uh, again I may be a bit of a pessimist, but I don't think that's possible. Um, ASEAN's got its share of its problems, um, whether it's with pollution or, or, or palm oil or or, or, or Myanmar, it's, it's just got too many issues of its own um, to think about a collective security response um, in the Gulf. Uh, it's got too many rivalries, um, so um, I just don't see a, um, a collective security um, action from ASEAN uh, for Gulf security. Thank you. Jonathan? Um, yeah, so one of the chapters, actually the closing chapter in the book was by N. Janardan, who teaches at the Anmar Gargash Diplomatic Academy here. Um, he actually is, is more optimistic about, than, than I am about the prospects for this, which is exactly why we asked him to write this chapter, you know, uh, the prospects for a, uh, an Asian-led uh, collective security approach to the Gulf. Um, I, I'm skeptical. Um, I think there are just far too many Asian rivalries uh, to, to even begin to imagine what some kind of collective security arrangement coming out of Asia would look like. Um, that's one of the things we kept seeing throughout the, the, the book was, you know, uh, Japan and Korea are bogged down not only with their own domestic politics, but regional pressures, whether it's each other or North Korea or China. Uh, China's dealing with, you know, all of its its own uh, borders, many countries that don't like or trust it. Um, India and Pakistan are focused on each other. You know, these rivalries are are not even beneath the surface. They kind of get um, they kind of get gleaned over a lot when people talk about this Asian century and you know, how Asia is all about, you know, economic engagement. Uh, there's just intense rivalries that haven't really come to the surface a whole lot. Uh, but I, I don't see how you could you could uh, imagine any kind of Asian approach to the Gulf. I mean, like Lee Chen said, if, if ASEAN is the most successful example of institutionalization within Asia, um, and, and that's not going to work, then how would you take these very serious rivalries and try to do something like that. Now, China's presented yet another one of its uh, many point plans. They have a five point plan for Gulf security that I believe was, came out in 2021. It's very, um, to my thinking, quite aspirational and flimsy. You know, the five points are advocate mutual respect, uphold equity and justice, achieve nuclear nonproliferation, jointly foster collective security, accelerate development cooperation. So I mean, nuclear nonproliferation is the only thing I think that has any kind of teeth that everybody can agree on on that. You know, everything else just seems like a bunch of lofty goals that don't really mean a whole lot in tangible terms, um, which is why I don't think anybody's looking for China to contribute to regional security. Uh, I think that's probably the big issue here is that uh, the U.S., what, what we saw in this book is no Asian country Although everybody seems to have deep interests and, and concerns about Asian or Gulf security or insecurity, uh, most countries are still hoping that the U.S. is going to, you know, um, maintain or resume its traditional role, uh, and thus relieving them of the burden of, of stepping up. And uh, I think that's probably a safe bet in the short term. Um, now, as to Clement's question about China and uh, Sun Degong's excellent chapter on China Zero 
enemy policy. Um, so zero enemy um, is just kind of a nice way to say, you know, um, I, I, a lot of Chinese people talking about the Gulf refer to this friends to all, enemies to none, right? That we we can approach the region differently. And you see this time and again, right? So Xi Jinping went to Riyadh in December, um, signed billions of dollars worth of, of deals with the GCC, with Arab League, with Saudi. Um, but in the joint communique, actually kind of threw Iran under the bus. Uh, there were a couple of things where uh, there was language that said, you know, we, we agree to work with the GCC to um, try to slow down Iranians' nuclear ambitions. We want to keep the region free of nuclear weapons, and we want Iran to maintain, you know, um, uh, it's, it's non, um, you know, to, to stay away from developing this capacity. And also that supported the UAE in this uh, islands dispute where Iran sees some islands that uh, traditionally been administered by Russell Khaimah and, and Sharjah, and Iran sees them back in 1971. Iranians uh, reacted with fury, right? The government summoned the Chinese ambassador to their office to, you know, explain why this was wrong. Um, opposition figures wrote, you know, very angry op-eds saying, you know, the government has blown our only great power relationship that matters. Uh, they were very, very upset, which is why I think President Raisi was in, in China last week to try to restore a bit of balance to it. Um, Clemens asked if, if China has a best friend. I mean. I think they do. I think it's the GCC. And within the GCC, I think it's the Emirates uh, or maybe the Saudis. But they're never going to say that, you know, because why alienate a potential market of 85 million people? So, you know, I think China's trying to maintain this, this zero enemy approach because, again, nobody expects China to solve the issues in the Gulf. That's what people expect the US to do. Um, you know, what China says time and again is, we're willing to support Gulf actors or Middle Easterners. The Middle East should be should be controlled by the people of the Middle East. It shouldn't be controlled by a foreign patriarch. And of course, by saying this, they're referring to traditional colonial powers in the U.S. Uh, trying to differentiate itself, but it doesn't offer a positive vision. It's mostly like we'll support you in breaking free of the yoke of these external actors that you know tell you what to do. What will we do instead? Yeah, we'll, we'll support you in development. We'll, we'll invest, we'll do business with you. Uh, but that's kind of as far as we're willing to go at this point. So um, yeah, I think I think China is, is been able to play a pretty smart approach. Uh, it's not asked to do much and it, it makes a lot of money while it does it. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, uh, three other questions uh, that we will uh, we'll take uh, for the, probably uh, that might be the last round. Um, the one general question, which is about Gulf perceptions of Asia, uh, so the other way around, and uh, uh, because Jonathan, you you mentioned uh, at a certain point that the the Asian knowledge, the Asian expertise on the Gulf is um, is limited and uh, and quite new. Uh, what about the other way around? Uh, how would you and each of you um, look at Gulf? understanding of uh, the Asian uh, nuances, all the, the, the issues that you, uh, you mentioned with regards to each country and also the, uh, the general framework of uh, Asian politics. Uh, so that's the, the first question. The, the second question uh, is a, a more specific question uh, for Yi Huang, uh, and that relates to uh, Japan and Iran. And th the question is, uh, and that, that comes from the audience. It's uh, uh, emphasizing the fact that Japan is suffering from uh, the nuclear crisis with North Korea. The fact that uh, Japan uh, is worried about uh, North Korea's role in proliferation. And how how do you make uh, uh, sense of the fact that Japan is worried about North Korea, but not so much uh, about or uh, it doesn't really play an active role uh, in uh, the case of Iran. Uh, so how can we make sense of that apparent paradox? Um, uh, the other question is uh, uh, for Leach, and, and that's a very specific question, which is about the fact that in your chapter uh, you you mentioned the fact that Singapore uh, has established regional training centers in Doha and Jordan. 
And uh, my colleague uh, Asif Shuja from uh, the Institute would like to know more about uh, this type of engagement between Singapore, uh, uh, Qatar, and uh, Jordan. Uh, I'll ask first to Jonathan to uh, answer uh, the question because I understand that Jonathan, you have to leave us in about five minutes uh, uh, because you have to meet with your students, uh, maybe to talk about the Iraq war and to explain what happened uh, tw 20 years ago. Actually, I'm going to give them a midterm so they probably would like you to keep engaging me as long as possible. <laughs> um, so the question of, of going from the other direction, I mean, I think it's a great question. It's one that I would love to see that book. And I've been talking to different folks from the region um, to try to, to, to put that book together. Um, you know, I think there's a, a realization here in the Gulf that Asia is a very, very important um, group of countries for the GCC. And, and I'm sure it's the same in Iran, you know, because they keep talking about this look East policy. Um, I think it's. I think there's just this realization that the biggest trading partners, the biggest market for energy, um, are all found in Asia. Not just that, but also that there's a lot of, you know, other types of ties, whether they're familial ties, uh, cultural ties, religious ties that go back a very long time. And so it's quite uneven. You know, like if I talk to my Emirati students about Asia, you know, they, they have very general perceptions of, of China. It's the superlative country. It's the biggest, the richest, the strongest, the strong, whatever. But they don't know very much about China. It still seems very foreign to them. Culturally, linguistically, not many people are studying the language. Um, and China's soft power is really, really, really limited. You know, they do things like the Confucius Institute and media outreach. But frankly, their pop culture is, you know, it's coming out of a a Marxist Leninist country where most of the stuff that's being produced is being produced knowing that the party's watching everything. So hip hop songs about the Belt and Road or hip hop songs about uh, Xi Jinping don't really travel too well. Um, you know, on the other hand, uh, I lived in Korea for five years before I moved here and I didn't think anybody from the UAE would be interested about my time there. Everybody here is learning Korean. Everybody loves Korean dramas, K-pop. Um, same thing with anime and manga. So there are some cultural familiarities in, in some of these places, but you don't see students studying the languages, the history. There's very little area studies here in the Gulf. Um, I don't know of any actual area studies programs at any university here. Um, and what people do study, I mean, at my university, my students learn everything in English because they tend to look you know, westward. They had the UK experience, they've had the American experience. That is where everybody's eye is naturally drawn. I, I think that's starting to change. You can see they're introducing Chinese into the K-12 curriculum. Um, you know, other people are, are trying to learn about these countries, but it still seems quite niche. So it's not there yet. There are people like, um, you know, Dola Baboud, who I see has joined the chat. Um, my, my um, you know, some of Mohammed Al-Suderi, who I've worked with on other book projects. There are folks in the Gulf who are, who are systematically looking at this stuff. But it's still early days, and I, I think what what uh, what I hope to see, you know, more work from the Gulf looking out, uh, explaining how uh, Haliji people are thinking about Asia would be really, really valuable contributions. And with that, I've got to go bug my students with this midterm. So I'll just say again, thanks so much for the opportunity, and I hope to see you guys in Singapore soon. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Lichen, would you like to? Uh... Sure. Um, okay, so Gulf perceptions of Asia, or you know, let me turn it to Singapore more, more um, specifically, um, and at the same time I can answer um, Asif's question. So um, Gulf perceptions of Singapore, uh, the one thing that they always are um, enamored by is our human resource, right? Um, the, the human talent. So every time that they meet a Singaporean, they go, oh my God, you're from Singapore? Wow, how awesome, you know, you, you're, you guys are so effective, you know, how, how do you do that? How do you take a small country with no resources at all from being this, you know, amazing country, which quite a lot of them have visited. Um, so there is a very positive perception of Singapore. There isn't a perception that Singapore 
um, unlike Israel, that Singapore is kind of like a back channel way to better relations with the US, or that Singapore is a back channel way to better relations with China, right? Unlike, unlike quite a lot of Gulf states here, they will see Israel um, playing that back channel role, um, you know, uh, better relations with the US. Um, but Singapore is not perceived that way, um, but it's actually more appreciated for itself, right? Particularly for its, as I say, its human expertise. So you will find a lot of Singapore. Singaporeans um, that are engaged, um, not just in the UAE, but also the Saudis in Oman, in Qatar, in various areas such as air traffic control, right? Uh, much to the Singapore government's dismay, a whole lot of Singapore air traffic controllers left and came to the Gulf. Um, there are a lot of them uh, who are in the tourism departments because of Singapore's uh, success of tourism. They've been poached. Uh, you find um, a lot of media-related people who have media expertise in Singapore being poached here as well. Um, so Singapore is quite um, very well regarded for its human uh, expertise, um, as well as in the training centers that um, Asif mentioned. Um, Singapore is a cooperation program that it, it runs with um, developing countries, um, as well as countries in the Middle East. Um, they have opened more of these centers. Um, to train um, diplomats or civil servants in these, um, like in Jordan, uh, Qatar, Oman, uh, Kuwait, uh, to train these civil servants in aspects of civil service, um, how to have a seamless civil service like in Singapore, rather than a more siloed approach um, to what the Gulf states have here, right? So this ministry might not talk to another ministry, this agency might not might not talk to another agency. So there's very little coordination between different government agencies in the Gulf. Uh, but in Singapore, it seems to be seamless. So this is something that you know they look to Singapore uh, in, in terms of training. And I think this has been very, very successful um, in bringing about a really positive um, image of um, Singapore in the region. And, and this was actually one of the major outreach programs in the early 2000s um, that Singapore actually um, brought to the Middle East, right? A, a kind of more, um, you know, government to government engagement, but in the, I guess, softer skills rather than the security skills in the softer skills of, you know, governance. Thank you very much, Li Chen. Uh, and uh, final uh, uh, comments, uh, Yi Kuan. Thank you so much. Um... I realize that we're almost out of time, so I'll just uh, make some quick uh, comments um, about the Gulf perceptions of uh, Japan. I think um, um, a lot of it has to do uh, with uh, Japan's uh, soft power uh, projection and quite related to um, uh, Jonathan's point about, you know, um, anime, uh, you know, we receive quite a lot of uh, Emirati students at our university on exchange. Um, many of them come to us uh, uh, with very strong uh, familiarity of uh, Japanese anime series. They even know which episodes, uh, you know, which uh, characters appear. And uh, yeah, they know much more about uh, some Japanese people, actually, uh, about uh, anime. So uh, that's one dimension of that perception. Um, I think a separate perception has to do with uh, Japan's image as a science and technology innovation uh, path. Um, so a lot of these students come to us and they also want to learn about, you know, Japan's technological uh, innovations, uh, technological innovation policy. Um, and also, I think increasingly in recent years, uh, Japan's uh, technology in renewable energy as well, uh, desalination, um, you know, how to achieve uh, net zero targets, you know, so I think th those are, are increasingly part of this uh, image uh, of uh, Japan. Uh, less so, I think, in terms of, uh, say, hard power or, or sort of uh, security uh, contributions uh, to uh, the region. Um, and I'll, I'll just make a, a quick comment on Japan uh, and Iran's uh, nuclear uh, uh, program. So Jonathan uh, mentioned that, uh, you know, it's quite unsettling to, to live in uh, the Gulf uh, region. It's actually also very unsettling living in Japan. Uh, we get uh, North Korean missiles flying over our heads uh, quite regularly. Uh, and just last week, uh, landed off the coast of uh, Hokkaido. So um, th that is it's is something that is very closely uh, felt by uh, Japan, and and you know is as we all know, Japan's part of the, uh, the six power uh, talks uh, on uh, how to rein in the uh, North Korean uh, missile uh, program. So um, it is a, a very imminent and and almost existential uh, challenge uh, for uh, Japan, whereas the North Korean. Uh, whereas the Iran uh, crisis seems a bit more distant 
uh, from um, Japan. And I think a lot of that has to do with the calculations that, you know, North Korea has obviously got the, the technology and, you know, the, the missile uh, technology to deliver, um, you know, it's, it's uh, essentially a, a nuclear miniaturized warhead. Uh, internet in, uh, and Japan is in close distance uh, to uh, North Korea, whereas uh, Iran uh, doesn't uh, seem to quite have that, uh, you know, technological means to deliver uh, a warhead, or even it doesn't have the intention in the first place to pose a threat to, to Japan. So from the Japanese uh, threat perception calculus, um, North Korea is far more a imminent threat uh, compared to um, Iran, where Japan has actually maintained uh, relatively good relations uh, over um, the years. So um, in, in that sense, I think that part of explain, uh, sort of explains, you know, the, the Japanese threat perception in terms of capabilities uh, and also in terms of intentions of a potential uh, adversary. So for North Korea, it's a very clear threat, uh, whereas for, for Iran, uh, it's, it's more of a, a, a country that Japan has actually invested quite a lot in. Uh, to maintain amicable uh, relations over the past decade. Stop. Thank, you. Thank you very much, and uh, that's a that's a fascinating uh, uh, issue. And uh, I'm uh, I'm tempted to say that uh, we'll we'll have to uh, to see how the, the situation in Iran evolves uh, as uh, we see uh, the the the, the, um, the progress with uh, regards to uh, uranium enrichment. Uh, this may actually change uh, the the view, the perception of a country uh, like Japan. So definitely a topic to follow. Uh, this uh, ends uh, our our book talk. Uh, uh, let me uh, thank uh, both of you as well as Jonathan uh, for your engagement, uh, for uh, your participation to uh, the event. Uh, for everyone, as I said, uh, if you uh, if you're interested, you can access freely the book uh, on the website of uh, Taylor Francis. I added. Uh, the link, uh, as well as my colleague Sharon at the beginning of uh, the, uh, the discussion, you can access it directly uh, from the chat box. Uh, it's, uh, again, uh, a very fascinating book on a topic that is still emerging. So uh, this, uh, this is uh, definitely a conversation that needs to, uh, to be continued. Uh, again, many thanks uh, to both of you, and uh, we uh, look forward to uh, uh, welcome you back uh, at an event uh, with the Institute. Thank you all. Thank you for moderating, Shondu, and thank you to NUS MEI for hosting. Thank you. Thanks very thank much, Jean-Luc.